So, um, every year around this time, we start talking about the fall feasts. Um, normally, if I wouldn't have went to Israel for several weeks, I would have been teaching for about a month up into the fall feasts. Um, so, what I, what I did this year is I just did like an overview. And um, I'll be starting back on the series of Is Yeshua God? And I cannot wait I may do it next Sabbath, but um, uh, because um, just got a lot going on with the fall feast, but um, yeah, next Sabbath, we're going to look into some really, really cool stuff in regards to the writings of um, Orthodox Judaism, the prayer books of Orthodox Judaism, and how that people are actually seeing that Yeshua is the Messiah and seeing that Yeshua is divine. He is God. Straight out of um, Orthodox writings and Orthodox uh, prayer books. It's really cool stuff that we're going to look at. Um, and so just getting back to proving that Yeshua the Messiah is eternal. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know he's eternal? He was not created at a set time. He's the firstborn of all creation. But that doesn't mean that he had a birth. It doesn't mean at any time he was the eternal son of God. From everlasting, God has been a unity. Amen? Amen? Yes. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so, amen. So today we're going to pick up on a series of the fall feasts. This is part two. Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, the feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim as holy rehearsals. These are my feasts, the feasts of Yahweh, holy rehearsals, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time. Now, what I've done there, it really doesn't say that in any translation. This is my translation, but I'm going to read you what the New King James says in that passage. So it says this. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. Say holy convocation. Holy convocation. And what I've done is I've just put uh, holy rehearsals because really that's what that word convocation means. Um, these are my feasts. And then it says you're supposed to proclaim them at the appointed time. So here's what we're doing. We're here to proclaim the feasts of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The fall feasts are coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I will act silly for the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. Make proclamation. Shout so that everybody knows the fall feasts are coming. So some of you are going to know this. This first part is a little basic stuff, and then we're going to get into some cool things. The word feast in Hebrew is moed. Say moed. 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 When you come to the word feast, you should begin to train yourself to say appointment. So these are the feasts of the Lord. These are the appointments of the Lord. And um, so feast is moed, and the word moed means a set time or an appointment. So the feasts are appointments of Yahweh, which you are proclaimed as holy rehearsals. So in the uh, King James, in most translations, it says holy convocation, right? The word holy also means sacred, and that's the word kodesh. Say kodesh. kodesh. It means holy or set apart or sacred. The word convocation is also the word to have an assembly. And in Hebrew, it's the word mikre. Say mikre. So the way that you say holy convocation is mikre kodesh. Say mikre kodesh. Okay. So when you actually break down the word mikre, it means a rehearsal. What is a rehearsal? A rehearsal is what you do before you do the real thing. How many of you ever been in dramas in church? You know, how many of y'all in the How many of you have been in the Christmas play? Oh, how many of you have watched the kids do the Christmas play? You get falling out laughing, you know what I'm saying? Some funny stuff happening in the Christmas play. But what did all the kids do for a whole month? They did the rehearsal over and over and over and over and over until they thought they could do it. And even if they didn't, uh, you know, whoever's in charge is like, y'all are getting on there and doing it. So that's what, well, that's what the feasts are. The feasts are appointments, say appointments, to worship and rehearse. That's what the feasts are. 
If our Christian friends could just have it understand, explained that easy, they would understand what it is. There are eight feasts. So the feast days are appointments to worship Yahweh and rehearse the gospel of the kingdom. And um, there are eight feasts mentioned in Leviticus 23. Seven come every year. Seven are yearly. One is a weekly cycle. And then God gives us a celebration that's not an actual feast, but it is a celebration to meet and worship, and that is called the new moon, Rosh Chodesh. So every week we have an appointment with God. Every month we have an appointment with God. And seven times throughout the year we have appointments with God. And what are we doing on these appointments? We are worshiping, say worshiping, and rehearsing. Okay. Shabbat. So y'all all know about that. That's why we're here. Six days work will be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation, a holy rehearsal. You shall do no work. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. This is important. Who's the Sabbath of? The Lord. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. It's the Lord's day, actually. I've done teaching on this in the past, but, you know, our Christian pastor friends speak of Sunday as the Lord's day, but scripturally, you can't prove that. You can't back that up in the scripture, and as a matter of fact, you can prove Sabbath is the Lord's day. Okay? Different message for a different time. In all your dwellings. What are we rehearsing? Let's think about it. So one day out of seven, and it's not the day you pick, it's, this, it's Saturday, the seventh day. Let's be literal, the literal, literal understanding of the Ten Commandments. It's not a pick a day, it's the Sabbath, it's Saturday, it's today. We're rehearsing. What are we rehearsing? The millennium, exactly. When we come together on Sabbath, and we worship, and we dance, and we sing, and then we eat together, we are rehearsing what it's going to be like for a thousand years of peace, and then even into eternity. Amen? What else are we rehearsing when we rest on Sabbath? We're painting a picture of what it means to rest in Christ. We've labored all week and we rest on that seventh day, which also gives us a picture of resting from trying to earn salvation. You cannot work to earn salvation. You have to rest in the completed work of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen? And that we are saved by grace through faith. Amen? And we must repent and have God's grace, and then we have salvation. It's nothing we can earn. So we're rehearsing that. We're walking that out too. It really is, you know, our Christian um, brothers have that part right. They do understand that the Sabbath was a picture of Yeshua. So, how many feasts are in Leviticus 23? Eight. Now, why? Because Sabbath is actually a feast. It's an appointment. So, it's the weekly appointment. Then you have seven, and they're divided into the spring feast and the fall feast, and then you have a summer feast. The spring feasts are Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Okay? This is Leviticus 23, 5 through 14. There's a feast that comes at the end of the spring, getting ready to go into the summer. It's called Shavuot or Pentecost. That's in Leviticus 23, 15. And then you have the fall feast, which we're getting ready to enter into. Yes, smile, everybody. Which, ha which is the Feast of Trumpets. Yom Truah. Say that with me. Yom Truah. And... Truah or teruah, truah, actually means to shout really loud. That's what it means. The day of the shouting, or some rabbis put it, the day of the awakening blast. So we call it the Feast of Trumpets, but literally the word shofar isn't even in the title. Anywhere, never in the Bible. We just call it that. Why? Because the way that we blow the shofar is... Um, the way that we make a teruah is with the shofar. A teruah is either a loud shout or a blast of the shofar. Okay? Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, 
a holy rehearsal. You shall do no servile work, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Okay. So, what's interesting is, within the feast days, we have Sabbath days. If you can get off work this upcoming Monday, try to get off work. Why? It's not just a Sabbath, it's called a high Sabbath. It's a holy day that we're to try to get off work, if at all possible. If you cannot, don't beat yourself up. We're in exile. We live in, you know, Tennessee. And so at some point in the future, when God reigns on the earth, uh, the Bible says we'll all, all nations will keep the feasts and we'll understand the calendar and we'll have these days off. It'll be automatic. It'll be like, nobody's going to have to worry about Sukkot. Won't that be cool? Amen. When you don't have to talk to the boss. The boss got the memo from Rabbi Yeshua. He's like, look, they're getting off. If not, I will just won't let any uh, uh, rain happen over there in your uh, territory. So. so right now we're in the sixth month. When the sun sets Sunday night, we're moving into the Feast of Trumpets, okay? Which is the first day, say the first day, of the seventh month. Okay, now all the fall feasts happen in the seventh month. Then we have the Day of Atonement, which goes by two names in the Bible. Yom Ha Kippurim, say that. Yom Ha Kippurim, which literally means the Day of the Coverings. It's plural. And then in another place it's called Yom Kippur, or the Day of the Covering. Okay? This is in Leviticus 23. 26, and Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, so when is the day of atonement? Tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation or rehearsal for you. And you shall afflict your souls, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. And you shall do no work on that day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your God. For whatsoever soul that shall not be afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul that does any work in that same day, that same soul I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of complete rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at even. This is a proof text that the days actually begin in the evening of the day before. From even to even, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Okay? So that's why we're, we're meeting Tuesday night. Yom Kippur is actually Wednesday. So Tuesday night, we're having a service. We're all going to wear white. We're going to have worship. We're going to do some traditional liturgy. We'll have a... a Message from the Word, and then we will fast from the moment we leave here from evening of the 9th all the way to the evening of the 10th. And like Jessica said, we will either meet here and go somewhere, or depending on how many people want to go break the fast with us, we'll just meet somewhere and eat together. Okay? What's interesting about Yom Kippur is that it's called a Sabbath of complete rest. It's the most holy day of the year. It is, uh, in the Hebrew, it's called a Shabbat, Shabbatan. It means a Sabbath of all Sabbaths. It is uh, the holiest Sabbath of the year, okay? And it's a day that, um, because it was a day when, this is the only day that God established throughout the year, before Yeshua came, say before Yeshua, before. that intentional sin could be forgiven, See, if you mess up and you make an accidental sin, you can come and you can have a, a sin offering. You can bring it. But if you're premeditated and you're sinning on purpose and you mess up and you knew it and you did it anyways, you couldn't have that forgiven until Yom Kippur. And then you had to fast. So, um, and it was the only day that the high priest could go in behind the veil and he would take blood in there um, and he would splash it on the side of the Ark of the Covenant in order to give forgiveness for the people for intentional sin. So it's a very holy day. And there's a day coming in the future, according to the uh, prophets, that the fast in the seventh month will be a time of joy. Okay, so sometime in the future, and I'm just assuming sometime after the millennium or some part-time through there, I don't really know when it's going to happen, 
God's going to declare that Yom Kippur because it says in the prophecy that the fast in the seventh month will become a time of celebration and joy. So, it's the only day that we fast in the seventh month. So, praise the Lord. At some point, God will fix that and give us a day to feast. And then we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which goes by several names. The Feast of Booths, the Camp Out Feast, all those things like that. In Hebrew, it's called Sukkot. What's a Sukkah? Say Sukkah. What's a Sukkah? Temporary dwelling place. It's like a tent. It's a man, literally a manger. It's exactly right. How many of you know a sukkah is a manger in the New Testament? So when Yeshua was laid in a manger, it wasn't the rock little bed that uh, feeding trough. He was he was in a manger. Uh, he was in a sukkah. Away in a sukkah, no crib for a bed. The little Yeshua, la, 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 la. Get ready. We're modifying all these songs. <laughs> Hallelujah. I tell you this. When I was being convicted of Christmas and I was in the church, and the Lord didn't let me have a release for <laughs> many years of Christmas. But I wouldn't go on Christmas Day, but I would go all the Sundays leading up. And you know, just like WCQR starts playing Christmas music way before Christmas, they're doing it in the Assemblies of God, right? So I would just, my stomach would turn when we're singing about Christmas songs. I'm thinking, I couldn't even sing them. So I just wouldn't sing them because it was a conflict within me. And then I remember one year, and the Lord told me I could sing all those songs at Sukkot. And I remember the first time that we did it, it awesome because there's no conviction and you're singing about all these awesome songs and it's at the right time at the right place it's a good feeling he always spoke to Moses saying speak to the children of Israel and say to them on the 15th day of the seventh month there'll be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to Yahweh on the first day there should be a holy convocation or a rehearsal you shall do no work no servile work you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh on the eighth day, there's also a holy convocation or rehearsal. You shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It's a solemn assembly. You should do no work. These are the feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations or rehearsals to offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. A burnt offering, a meat offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything upon his day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, beside all your free will offerings, which you gave to Yahweh, and then again, this is really important. Sukkot is the only one of the feasts that's mentioned twice in the list. Also, the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you should keep a feast to Yahweh for seven days. It's also called the Feast of Ingathering. And you have seven species of... of uh, how many of you saw the, the teaching that uh, Tom and Ken did from Dan on YouTube? Two of you guys, you're not on the YouTube channel that much. I put a new teaching. You need to go check it out. Tom and Ken did a teaching from Dan on the calendar and on the, on the, um, the ripening of the fruit, which is really cool insight that they were discussing there. But there are seven species of um, fruit that are harvested and ripen in the fall. Okay? And those seven species represent all the different people from all the nations that will come together and be in the kingdom and come together to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you were to go do a Google search or you should go to Bing Images and type in Jerusalem Feast of Tabernacles, you will see thousands of flags. They do parades. The, anybody from those that are um, from Malaysia to the Cherokee Indians are there. Everybody in between are going to Jerusalem and celebrating Sukkot, and they got all their flags. Amen? And um, it's the greatest party of the year. But it's called the Feast of Ingathering. And it says that on the first day, we're to have a Sabbath, and the eighth day will also be a Sabbath. So within the Feast of Tabernacles, you have two Sabbaths, which is really cool. The two days to rest at the front and at the end of the Feast and it says that you're supposed to take um, tree branches, palm trees, thick trees, willow trees. You're supposed to take fruit and boughs of trees. And you're supposed to bundle them up and wave them and dance before the Lord. 
And that's one of the most fun things that we get to do at the Feast of Tabernacles. It usually makes me laugh so hard when I watch all the people dancing around in a circle with fruit and branches and just forgetting about who's around. It's really cool. Um, And there's a lot of joy. You can't dance with a lemon in this hand and a palm tree in this hand and have a pouty face. It's just impossible. (laughs) Can't do it. Automatic smile kicks in. Could be because you're watching your neighbor, but it is fun. So that's one of the things that we get to do. And it's not an option. It actually says we're supposed to do it. And it says, well, to keep that feast as an appointment of the feast to Yahweh seven days in the year, and it'll be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And then he gives us more instructions on the Feast of Tabernacles. What are we actually supposed to do? Dwell in booths. Now, your booth could be a tent with 14 people in it. Threw that out there for some of you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Or your booth could be an RV. I mean, look, God gives that option. It's open, all right? (laughs) However you do your temporary shelter, do your temporary shelter and have fun. So you dwell in a booth for seven days um, that all your generations will know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. As we're camping out, one of the main things that God wants us to do is remember that our forefathers camped out for all those years as they came out of the wilderness. It's also po- supposed to teach us of the temporary nature of man. We're, we're in a temporary booth right now. See, we're looking forward to the day when this mortal body is glorified and becomes immortal, Right? One of the things I want you to do also as you prepare to camp is I want you to ask God this year, I want you to to ask God to allow you to have quiet moments with Him. The men are going to meet at the fire every morning when the sun comes up and we're going to have prayer. Okay, so guys, the first appointment of the day is around the fire pit. First thing in the morning, we're meeting there. Um, And we're going to set this whole feast apart with prayer and worship. But ask God to help you not get busy, that you can have quiet time, downtime, to sit and listen and worship and have private moments with Him. Ask, to, ask Him to speak to you while you're there. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's actually a time where we're just supposed to love on Him and love each other. That's what Sukkot is. It's a bonding experience. Right, Patty? She saw the congregation just in a new way last year, didn't you? I remember you telling me about that. It was awesome. First day of the seventh month is Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. It's a Sabbath. And the Bible doesn't tell us how to celebrate this day. Our Jewish brother, have some, they have some awesome traditions. How many of you were at Trumpets last year? We do the traditional shofar blowing. So when we go to Pastor Scott's, I'm not sure exactly what he's going to do. Um, we are going to have a shofar blowing contest. Everybody, listen. Bring your shofars to Pastor Scott's. And we've got some awesome prizes that we're going to be giving away. We've got donations from the land of Israel. We've got donations from another brother, a Messianic Jewish brother. We've got some prizes that we're going to have. But we're going to have a shofar blowing contest. You're going to have prizes for the top three. So bring your shofar and, and uh, enter the contest, and we're going to have a good time. It's one of the things we're going to do. But the only thing the Bible tells us to do on that day, and Sharon actually taught me this, and I didn't even think about it. It's not even mentioned anywhere in the New Testament that they kept the Feast of Trumpets. But we know they did, but it's not in there. Because Yeshua and the disciples are keeping all the feasts. It's a day to blow shofars. Okay? So have a lot of fun there. It begins at night on a day which no man knows the day or the hour. So, when Yeshua says that his, his coming is like a thief and that no man knows the day or the hour, why is he saying that? Because in order to have um, the first day of the month, there has to be a sliver of the moon. You have to be able to see it. And there's a two or three day window in there is when that could be. Okay? And so Yeshua, there's a code there. No man knows the day or hour is actually a code that talks about the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets um, is also a time for judgment to commence. 
It's a time to repent and prepare ourselves for the Day of Atonement, and it's a time for Yeshua to return in the clouds. At some point in the future, most people that have studied the feast, and I agree, I believe that it will be at a future Feast of Trumpets when the great shofar will sound, and the rapture, what most people call the rapture, that's when that's going to happen, in my opinion. It's a day of remembrance. What are we supposed to remember? We actually remember Pentecost. Um, and so the, the Feast of Trumpets has many themes, marriage, judgment, and also announcing that the king is coming. Okay? So when that great shofar blows in the sky, that's the greatest announcement that the king is coming. The whole earth is going to hear it and see him coming in the clouds. The Day of Atonement is uh, the Day of Covering. It's the tenth day of the seventh month. So trumpets is which day? F trumpets is the first. Yom Kippur is the tenth, and they're both in the seventh month. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is the fifteenth day, right? And it's seven days long plus an extra day called the eighth day. And this eighth day is spoken of in the New Testament when it says that Yeshua went on the great and holiest day of the feast. It's in uh, John, oh goodness, somewhere in the book of John. It's just a whole book of John. You'd find it in there somewhere. So he goes in on the great and last day of the feast, and, and they're having the water pouring ceremony. Um, so uh, Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the seventh month. It goes through the 22nd, and there's the first day and the eighth day are also Sabbath days. Yes, let's just put this in here again. I mentioned this last week. Sukkot is not a time that we're going to meet together for the purpose of just drinking alcohol. Okay? We had people last year get a little bit carried away with that. But you are allowed to drink. But if you can't handle yourself in a holy manner, then it's best not to drink. Okay? Uh, so don't look at Sukkot as a party. Look at it as a time to worship the Lord. All right? Although it is a party, it's a holy party. So we're going to close with this. Humans were made in God's image. Now check this out. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created he them. So the word image there is the word zelim. Say that with me. Zelim. zelim. And it means image or shadow. Say shadow. shadow. So man was created in God's image, which that same word means shadow. And they're, they're the same. So God created man in his own shadow. In the shadow of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So they, those are synonyms. Image and shadow. And just think about this. If you have a big light and it shines on you from one side, what comes on the ground? Your image. It's your image, right? We just have a word for it called shadow. <coughs> so the feasts were made in his image also, and the feasts are also called his shadow. And I'm going to show you this. I'm going to connect... The concept of man keeping the feasts with the word shadow. Now, uh, a lot of people use this as a text to tell us that we don't have to keep the feasts. But I'm going to show you what it really says. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink. Why does it say that right there at the top? Why is it about meat and drink? And this is why. Because there were people in the days of when Paul was writing this that were absolutely 100% against alcohol. Okay? And there were people that were saying you had to be, you, you could eat whatever you want. Paul's telling the people, don't let people judge you on your diet. Okay? In meat or drink. All right? So your diet's not... Um, don't let people judge you based on what your diet is. Or in respect to a feast day, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So 
for many years I would deal with pastors and people that I would talk to about the feast, and they would say this right here, they're just a shadow. Why are you doing that? You don't have to do it. Don't let anybody judge you. They're just shadows. And uh, kind of hard to figure out for a while, but the reality is they are shadows, and that's why we do them. When it says right here, but the body is of Christ, the word body in Hebrew is basar. Say basar. It also means flesh. So basar means body and basar means flesh. And this word basar is also the word for the gospel. How do you say gospel in Hebrew? Anybody know? Besorah. Besora. So the gospel in Hebrew has this word, besor, as the root of it. So, the gospel is connected to the body and the flesh of the Messiah. So, these two words here, um, as you can see, this actually is supposed to have another vowel in it, but it doesn't have it there. Do you see how they're the same? Okay? So gospel and flesh are the same words. Why am I saying that with you? I want to show you what it says in Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings glad tidings, that brings the besora, that publishes peace, that bring glad tidings, besora, of good news, that publishes salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the besora, the flesh, and the gospel unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. And Nahum says this, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings what? The besora, the good news, the gospel, the flesh, that publishes peace, O Judah. Now check this out. Look at that. Nahum, I want you to see this. Nahum connects the gospel with the feasts. Isn't that interesting? Why? Why? The reason the church has had their eyes veiled to Leviticus 23 for so many years is because Leviticus 23 is the gospel. And the gospel is the flesh of the Messiah. And the flesh of the Messiah and the gospel cannot, say cannot, be separated from the feasts. When, when What we've done in Christianity is we have separated the gospel from the feasts. And we say, you don't need the feast, you just have the gospel. That's not scriptural. And then add to that, we say instead of the Bible feasts, we need to bring in secular pagan holidays in order to worship the God of the Bible and celebrate the gospel. So, there is a connection between the gospel and between the feast days. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect to a feast day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day, which are shadows of things to come. This word and is not in the text. Okay? So I'm going to read it now. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a feast day or a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, the body or the gospel of the Messiah. Do you get it? So when you realize that the feast days paint the perfect picture for the gospel story, and you realize that they are shadows, and then you put together what was Paul really saying? Listen, Paul was talking to people that had come out of paganism 
They had started keeping the feast and the Sabbath. Their friends were judging them, just like you've been judged, and they were saying, you don't have to eat that. You can still eat pork. Why are you doing that diet that way? Their friends were saying, you don't have to celebrate the feasts. It was getting back to Paul that all these non-Jews that were keeping the feast were being harassed by their friends. So Paul decides to write a letter and he says, don't let anybody judge you based on your diet, based on a new moon, based on the Sabbath, or based on the feasts. Those things are just shadows. They're the gospel of the Messiah. So the shadows are the gospel. Let no one judge you therefore in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? It's right here. Holy days, Sabbaths, and the new moons. Because within the holy days and Sabbath and new moons, we actually see the gospel laid out. Does that make sense? So the word image and the word shadow are synonyms. Man is made in the image or shadow of Elohim. And the feasts are made in the image of Yeshua. And they're also called his shadow. So you can't really... Behind that right there, Jesus, that picture of Yeshua is a big shadow. Okay? You can't see it there, but you got a light. And the reflection in the background is his shadow. And the only way, family... The only way that we can paint a perfect shadow of Yeshua is if we celebrate the feast days. I want to tell you how important the feasts are. The feasts show people what his shadow actually looked like, so the feasts actually show people what he looks like. And if we do the feasts... There's an image of Yeshua that we actually walk out in our life. If we do a mixture, the image of Yeshua is tainted and twisted and it's really not pure. Does that make sense? Yeshua is the substance and the feasts are his shadow or his image. Yeshua is the substance and believers are his body on earth, his image and his shadow. Do you understand that? I want you to get this. We are his shadow. Say that. The feasts are his shadow. So they both have to go hand in hand. You have to put the glove on and have it fit. So if we, the shadow of Yeshua, or God, were made in his shadow, if we walk out the feasts, we're combining his shadow with the feast shadow, and we're making a perfect representation of the Messiah, and we're proclaiming the gospel the whole time we do it. Amen. The feasts are his shadow. Believers are his shadow. Amen? Now, I've said this before, but if Yeshua's shadow paints a picture of the feasts, whose shadow paints a picture of the pagan holidays? So believers should not, we do, and we did, but believers really, if they could catch this, that when they operate in the pagan mixed holidays, they're in a, sh they're in a, shadow of a fallen angel you say oh it's not a big deal it really is a big deal because we're in his image we're his shadow we need to be in the right shadow when we're worshiping and celebrating him so the word flesh is basar say basar the gospel is besora say besora and their synonyms and they have the same root word. So the feast days are his shadow, which tell the story of his flesh or his gospel. So we have the first coming, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, is death, burial, and resurrection. Then we have 
at Pentecost the down payment or the promise of his second coming, which is the Messiah sent his Holy Spirit to live in us. Amen. And then in the fall feast, you have his second coming. The feast of trumpets is the catching up. The day of atonement is the judgment of the nations. And the feast of tabernacles is the 1,000 year rest. And wrapped up in all the feasts are the gospel. What is the gospel? First coming and second coming. And in the middle, the Holy Spirit. That's why the feasts are so important. So Yom Truah is Monday the 3rd. It begins Sunday night. We'll have a Sunday night service at the River of Praise. Bring your shofar and bring a snack. Yom Kippur is Wednesday, October 12th. It begins Tuesday night. The HMA will have a service here Tuesday night. Then we'll break the fast together Wednesday night. Sukkot is the 17th through the 24th. It begins Sunday night. We'll be camping that whole week. How many of you are camping with us? Raise your hand. Yes. How many of you are actually going to be able to stay the whole time? Awesome. Cool. Praise the Lord. It's going to be a lot of fun. How many of you are just going to come out and visit a little bit? All right. Cool. Listen, we are blessed to have the HMA because for years there was nothing like this. You know what I did? I camped all by myself in my yard. And if you can't come to the feast, put a tent up in your yard. Just do it. Do it all by yourself. Okay? I camped for years. Jessica wasn't in the tent with me. It's all right. I knew I had to do it. Amen. For some of these parts. And you know what? I had a little puppy. So if it gets cold, you can snuggle up to your puppy. It's always good to keep you warm. Hallelujah. If you're if you need a if you need a heating uh, blanket, you know, heated blanket or whatever. So, amen. Just wanted to give you a quick overview of the fall feasts. And um how many of you think that you know the days that the feasts occur well enough to explain to a Christian friend all seven of the yearly feasts? Could you tell somebody, I want you to raise your hand if you could tell them the month and the days that they occurred. Put your hands up high. That's awesome. For those of you that can't, just begin to read Leviticus 23 until you can. If you read it and read it and read it, then you can make notes for yourself, write it down, teach yourself when the feasts are, okay? So that you're confident and comfortable sharing Passover and Pentecost and those things. Amen? Hallelujah. You have the light of the world within you, Yeshua the Messiah, and you have the key to how to worship Him, the feast days. Those things are abiding within you. Amen? Be bold and courageous. And in love, share that with everybody, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the great time that we've had in your presence today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the worship service. Lord, prepare us for the Feast of Trumpets and the Fall Feasts. We're excited, Lord. We're excited about Sukkot. Bless your people this Sabbath in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom.